Um, I've actually been building energy efficient homes for 25 years and um, I'm actually working with the builder as a consultant to actually uh, bring this out to the marketplace so that homeowners have a choice to buy this. Tell me a little bit about um, why someone might want to invest their own money in a home that uses 50% less energy than a, a normal home. Uh, the house virtually pays for itself right from the first day. All the energy saving features in here save money that can be applied to mortgage payments. So the operating cost of this house is a lot lower. Tell me how this might be the sort of the wave of the future. I mean, what's what's sort of your your intention in terms of inspiring other builders and homeowners to, to go this route? We've actually um, we've put out a challenge to other builders to build at least one house to a 50% reduction in total energy use. And again, it's sort of a, a marketing 101 thing. The market hasn't been offering this product to people, and I think as we start offering it, um, we're gonna sell it. So if we sell it, people will buy. What, what's the difference about this house from the outside? Do you remember you gave us a little bit of slack on? Side yard setbacks. setbacks good one. So what happens on uh, an orientation like this, if we can actually make the house a little bit wider, we can get more windows on the front of it. So the other feature of this house from the outside, it, it basically looks like a normal house, um, except for the fact that it has big overhangs. So these three foot overhangs actually allow us to collect the, winter, the, the, the sunlight in the winter when we want it and actually reject it in the summer when we don't so we can reduce our air conditioning loads. The other thing the people standing further back are gonna notice on the front of this uh, model here, there's two solar thermal air panels. So when the sun is shining in the winter, they can collect almost 30% of the heat load for the house, okay? Um, on the side, on this west side, we actually have solar thermal water panels that are gonna annually supply about 60% of the hot water load to the house. Okay, so um, basically like Peter was saying, I think the trick is is that the, the architect, where's the architect here? Come on, yeah, Vincent, yeah. Um, it's a very attractive house, right everybody? Yeah, okay, and it looks like a conventional house and I think that's the trick, that it, it, it doesn't radically look like some of those first generation solar homes we saw in the early, the early 70s. Uh, anything else out here, Vincent? Other than the building system, the building envelope. So the, the, the stucco is actually a breathable membrane on the outside and it allows us to put more insulation on the outside of the, uh, the wood frame. So the walls in this house are almost R30, okay? So Minky's built Energy Star houses down there. Where's Paul Duffy? R20 down there? R20 okay. in the walls, full height basement insulation down there. Um, so th those are the typical upgrades to go to Energy Star, along with some mechanical changes. Ventilation system is standard in those houses, along with an upgraded heating system. So again, this sort of represents the next level of house that uh, the homeowner could get. The windows are actually low E squared windows, which have two tinted coatings. The windows down there would be about an R3. These ones are about an R4. Yeah, but ba basically window treatments um, the, the, the are one of the key areas of improvement in the building envelope over the last 20 years. Um, effectively, the early generation energy efficient houses, we went for multiple layers of glazing and we ended up right. with window frames that were very, very heavy and unmanageable for the purchaser. So they, there was this image of, of clumsy, awkward energy efficiency. What we're finding now is with the new higher technology windows, it's providing a lot more flexibility in terms of design. And it, it, as John said in, on other aspects of the house, it doesn't look that much different, but it just performs that much better. So in, in layman's terms, those double glazed windows up there actually outperform a triple glazed window. Correct. Okay. So I don't know how we're going to get everybody inside. Uh, I've actually been told the radiant floor has been running all night. So it's toasty down there, so you're going to get the point. Um, the other thing that's very important about building these homes is we can actually build in um, things for lower energy reduction like solar ready. These houses actually have all the panels on the outside. 
but we can make houses solar ready so that we can run all those systems at a later date. Um, the other thing that we have that's sort of unique to this house is the basement floor has under slab insulation and there's mass in there that we can actually use if we needed to to, your, to store solar thermal later on. So the whole trick is not actually adding the feature now but making sure we can build it in later. And, and really we've got to think about when any house is new house is built, we're losing the opportunity to do that to build the future into it. Yep. If we don't plan with these, some of these features in mind, uh, we end up in the situation that's not unlike the automobile version of a, of a Suburban. <laughs> when, the pri when the price goes up for, for, uh, for heating fuel, um, you're going to be stuck with a house that consumes a lot and you don't have really that much flexibility in terms of making improvements. So the notion is to try and design features in that deliver uh, something above and beyond code, but give you the flexibility going forward to make improvements over that. So uh, the stucco in this particular model and the insulation system that we used, it's whole house foam. So all the wall cavities have half pound, uh, lower density, water-based spray and foam. And the result of that is actually this home is one air change. So when that 40 mile an hour wind is blowing on the house in the winter, it'll only be giving up its heat once or twice a day. So this house here is actually three times tighter, two and a half times tighter than the, the houses over there. And the neat thing about the particular type of foam that's in this, this house is, let's say energy prices did go haywire. Let's say, for sake of discussion, energy prices went 10 times higher. Well, that foam, because it's a breathable foam, will not encapsulate the moisture in the wall. We can add additional layers of insulation in board of that foam by removing the drywall, strapping inside in the interior of the house. We have the flexibility going forward of making improvements at relatively modest cost. We don't necessarily have to go and reclad the exterior as is required for many, many homes that are built today. Okay, so what it what it boils down to, no pun intended, because we got a boiler in there, but uh, this house actually heats for about $1,800 less a year at 50 cents a cubic meter of gas. The thing we really have to think about is not the cost of energy, but to think about our available energy as a six pack of beer. And we've already drank three of those beers. So it doesn't actually matter what the beer costs, we better drink it slower or it's going to run out. Basically, in, in layperson's terms, we got a lot of clay here. We can't actually percolate surface runoff down through the soil. So standing over here be, beside our good American friend Max is a rainwater cistern. So somebody help me out. Is this 2,000 liters here? OK. 10 cubic meters. What does that translate into liters? 10,000 liters. So it's catching 100% of the rainwater on the roof and we're using it to flush toilets inside the house and for irrigation. How, do, how does this rainwater cistern actually help you guys at the town with, in terms of your infrastructure? Well, it helps us with uh, water draw to the house. Uh, there's a reduction in terms of the draw to water your lawn, to use water inside the house as well. There's a water connection to the house, but yeah, this will limit the, the draw and also, also limit the sewage effort that comes out into our sanitary sewer. And it, it's well also as as handling the, the runoff as well, okay. too, right? And in terms of, of uh, peak draws from the system, typically, when do your peaks occur? Well, typically, there's certain times of day, early in the morning, late in the afternoon, lunch time. What time of the year? Happen. In the summer, right? Yeah. So if you've got, if you've got um, the whole lot of water available from rain in the spring or, or other parts of the year, you can shed some of that peak. So essentially, uh, this kind of approach holds promise to eliminate those water shortages we start to hear about when we get into July weather. So this, this uh, subdivision doesn't need any uh, one lawn sprinkler police, right? So. Um, What's that? When these lawns are all green and everywhere else is brown, people are going to say, why? Why? Yeah, get those guys over there. So the, the, other, the other interesting thing about this, and I can only speak to a Toronto statistic, but again, everything does come down to energy. We're actually pumping around this water 
using pumping stations that use electricity. So if we're catching the water here and using it here, we're saving huge amounts of electricity for the municipality. Laundry, uh, we can't actually hook up to that yet. The plumbing code won't let us do that. We gotta treat the water before we do it. The, the, the nice thing about all renewable energy and all um, solutions like this environmentally are that the supply of the energy, the supply of the water is where you need it. Right. We don't have to go over hell and dale to get through the big pipe to get to Lake Ontario to supply this house. Part of what we're doing is eliminating the need for mega projects like that. So in, in, a, in a neat kind of way, it, it falls into the notion of small is beautiful and you know doing things locally versus going further and further afield. So that's part of the message as well. Well, if I just add, I don't know what the numbers are here in New, Newmarket, but in the city of Toronto, Electricity use for water pumping and sewage treatment is the single largest use of electricity for the city of Toronto. More than the subway, more than street lights, more than public housing, more than the city hall. It is the number one thing. Sometimes the water gets pumped, I understand, three times before it gets used on right. the top of a, an apartment building in downtown Toronto or an office. So this has got I electrical savings, major like electrical savings here as well. Peter, 62% yeah. of the bill. It's very good. And the other thing that, that, that happens in, in the city is with hard landscapes, a lot of the water that comes as rainfall runs off and is carried away in the storm drainage system and you've got problems that are associated with that. By capturing it for use, watering lawns over time, you're allowing that water to percolate into the soil over time, which of course is a benefit as well. Great. So one of the other things I'll point out, if you, if you actually look over at these houses being framed, um, so you can see the outboard insulation on the outside. There's actually more foam on the outside of the wall. Um, but the other really interesting thing is that all the wood that's being used for framing there is FSC certified. So it's all coming from a managed wood lot. Typically when we get lumber for construction, it's coming from clear cutting. Okay, so let's go into that warm, cozy basement. So it looks a little bit different down here than people's normal mechanical rooms. There's actually lots of boxes and each box does uh, a very special thing. Okay, so you'll you'll notice it's very toasty down here. So this floor is actually heating your body. And the temperature of that floor right now, it's because I got my little gadget here, is 84 degrees. Okay? So if we were going to finish this basement, it's very well insulated, so it's got a multiple layers of insulation down here. So probably almost three times as much as the building code requirement. But this little box here is circulating hot water through the floor. And this is a dual purpose hot water heater that's actually giving us the radiant floor. And we have radiant floors in different areas of the house. So we go into the room over the garage, you're gonna feel that warm floor is being very warm. This is sort of the next level of, uh, I'd refer to this as an integrated mechanical system. We don't have a separate hot water tank or a furnace. We have one heating plant that's actually doing a bunch of different jobs. And the really important thing to note here is that anybody that has an existing house and is about to change their furnace, this is the technology that you could put in. Just doesn't have to go in this house, it can go into an existing house. So for space heating, we're actually using this fan coil. There's a little bit of water leaking underneath it, which isn't good, okay. So right inside here, we actually have a heat recovery ventilator system. And the way that I, I like to uh, actually describe this is it's just like our body. This is actually the heart and it's pumping air or your body would pump blood to all your different organs. So this is pumping air to every single room in the house. But like your lungs, we're actually oxygenating the blood. And this heat recovery ventilator actually uses waste heat from bathrooms that's being exhausted, we're getting rid of the odors and the humidity to preheat fresh air that's coming in on a continuous basis. So although this house is very airtight, the air quality in here is second to none. Okay, And on the bottom here, we actually have a fan motor that's going to save this homeowner between three to four hundred dollars a year in electricity. So it's a DC motor like little batteries on magnets that uses eighty percent less electricity. 
So some of the things that you'll notice is we've got one box instead of two. So a lot of the newer homes come with a conventional furnace with uh, a ventilation device added to it. So they've integrated both devices into the one box, which means one fan versus multiple fans, one pump versus multiple uh, bits and pieces of controls, and that's part of the energy saving that you, you, you get when you go to the next level. The other thing in terms of this, this device here on the wall, one of the ways you can recognize how efficient it is, that's the chimney, folks. Plastic. It's plastic. So it must be pretty efficient if the byproducts of combustion have so much heat taken out of them, they go into plastic pipes. That's the wall. So that's, that's one of the ways you can tell. Also, it brings air in from outside and takes it back out to outside. It's what we call a sealed combustion unit. So all of this stuff contributes to a much more comfortable and a much safer and a much more efficient home. Okay, and so Paul's got one of those in his house and I've got one of those in my house. They've been around for a long time and they work. Okay, so if you're gonna change your furnace, ask the guy about a dual purpose water heater or boiler. And this is actually a holding tank for the solar thermal water collectors on the roof. These, uh, this line set here connects the tank to the roof and it's actually running a glycol solution up to the two panels to provide about 60% of the hot water heating to the house. And the really interesting thing to get here, folks, is that once people buy this, they get their energy for free. They're not hooked up to a gas line, they're not hooked up to electrical, they're getting their heat from the sun. The system back here is a grey water recycling system. So what we're doing here is we're collecting the bath water and the shower water that you use in your house when you're done with it, and we're reusing it to flush toilets. So that's going to save about 30% of the water that you would use in, in the typical house by reusing that water. Um, it's a really simple system and it's small. That's the beauty of grey water is we have a daily supply of grey water in the baths and showers. So we only need to store a day's worth of flushing. So we don't need a 10,000 litre tank. We only need 250 litres or 150 litres depending on the toilet. So uh, we don't actually have the toilet hooked up in that corner but we, we have a bucket over there and there's somebody over there going to flush for us. <laughs> So what's happening is the stored grey water is now supplying the toilet that's in the other corner. No, that's good. Flush it again. Sure, flush it again. So instead of using tap water, we're now using grey water. Rurally, instead of drawing water from a deep well, we're drawing it from the basement 30% of the time. So we're going to even see some energy savings if you're in a deep well situation. As a backup, we use city water to keep the pump from ever going dry so that you can always flush. And we also overflow, so if you shower more than you can flush, it'll overflow down to the, to the uh, city sewer. So again, just, just to underscore what we said outside, this system is actually reducing energy as well, right Chris? Because it's using the water twice in the house. Okay. I did some calculations. If everybody in Ontario was reusing grey water and pumping it in their basement instead of from the lake, Ontario municipalities would be saving $35 million a year in electricity costs. Wow. And very much of that electrical is coming from nuclear power generation and coal at peak. Conventional ductwork leaks about 40% of its air out. So because this is a lead platinum house, I'm actually going to come back and balance the system and make sure that the heat that was actually intended for a room is going to get there, okay? And that's something that's, that's uh, not done in residential construction right now. Um, again, I talked about the insulation. This is Roxel insulation. In LEED, we actually get points for using local materials, recycled content, and low emissions. So this actually gets one and a half points. The insulation in the walls is isonine, and we're actually getting, because of the air tightness effect on the house, an extra three lead points, okay, towards our 96. And again, we have the equivalent to R10 underneath the slab. So even if we didn't have the radiant 
floor running down here, Max, it would still be 10 or 15 degrees above what it normally is. Right. You didn't mention it, but I assume the boiler is modulating. Yeah, it's yeah. fully modulating. So it's like the accelerator in your car. Uh, right now it thinks it's a hot water tank, so it's only going to give us 45,000 BTUs. In the winter we can get up to about 99,000 out of that. And again, the thing to get in this house is on the coldest day of the year we only need 25,000 BTUs and 50% of that is coming from the sun. So that thing probably isn't going to be running on a sunny day. John mentioned the rule of solar heating in this house. Okay, so solar provides 60%. So this water, let's say on a typical day, you know, in the middle of the summer, might be hot enough that we don't require any heating whatsoever. So it would go into uh, this tank here, replacing the water that's drawn off for heating, and no heat would be added by the boiler. If we get into a winter situation where there's snow on the solar collector and the temperature in this tank is much lower, then we're supplying cooler water in here to replace the hot water we use. There's a loop that goes through the boiler which brings that tank up to temperature. In a lot of cases because we're using low flow appliances, low flow shower heads, that sort of thing, the draws are such that this secondary tank could be much much smaller. We could get away with a storage tank maybe of about 10 gallons if you actually do the calculations. A lot of the uh, 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 mechanical suppliers are not comfortable with that. In fact, you know, a 20 gallon tank is typically what's used because that's what they commonly stock. So we're, we're, we're in that transition where people are, are, are sort of looking at what does it take to, to do this type of uh, system and, and, and bit by bit as the need is arising, new, new technology is coming along. There is no heater in this tank. It is a storage tank. It has a thermostat that calls for heat when the temperature drops down. So if water coming from here is hot enough to replace the water, the hot water that's drawn out of the tank, it never calls for heat. If the temperature drops down to a certain level, it will trigger the thermostat, turn a pump on to circulate some of the water through the boiler before it comes into that tank. So the system is a little bit more complicated in some ways, but it's kind of cool. You could have all of your capacity supplied by solar and basically it flows through the system and the system never ever calls for heat. The, the difference with this cabinetry is that it's made with all no added urea formaldehyde uh, particle board. The particle board is 100% post-consumer recycled material. The binders are vegetable based uh, uh, rather than uh, formaldehyde based. Uh, as a result, basically uh, no off gassing and lead, uh, lead point compliance in that regard. Uh, the other things that we, we have with this product is FSC certified, and so it's certified by the Ford Stewardship Council. Uh, all the material here is again like the lumber in the house coming from uh, forests that are sustainably harvested. Uh, so as a result, the product has a, a lead, uh, contributes to lead points for the builder on a number of different levels. The, uh, the emission level because of the no added uh, urea formaldehyde, the FSC, uh, the sustainable forest approach, it is uh, again 100% recycled product, post consumer recycled, and also locally sourced. So in that way, and uh, the real important point from my standpoint here is in the grand scheme of things, all those extra lead points and, and all the uh, benefits from a sustainable forestry standpoint and from an air quality standpoint, come at a very small premium. Uh, compared to our regular cabinetry, this adds basically uh, no more than about 5% to the entire cost of the cabinetry. So. Okay, so this isn't funky art. This is actually drain water heat recovery. And these are connected to the two bathrooms upstairs. When the shower water goes down the tube, 60% of that energy is used to preheat the hot water tank downstairs. And again, this is a technology that's low tech. When you turn on the shower faucet, you're feeding the hot water tank. And that water that's coming from the street is coming up here. It's going from, I guess I should be Celsius, 10 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius. So it's raising the water temperature before it goes to the conventional tank. So this will save 40% on your water bill a year.
probably about 150 bucks. And uh, what we really need to happen is for energy to cost what it costs. Remember I talked about the six pack of beer? There's only three beers left. This should be a good investment. But energy costs are not reflecting their scarcity. I think the other feature, we're gonna have all hardwood floors here and they're gonna be FSC, again, from a managed wood lot. So let's go upstairs. This floor is gonna be actually a little bit higher than air temperature and closer to your core body temperature. So there's a radiant floor in here. This is the room over the garage, which is normally quite cold. Water. Yeah. Yeah, but that's mostly for cooling, Max. Yeah. It's in floor. No below. So look at it. We're getting uh, 80 degrees. Just the tubing. Now, do you use the aluminum plates to? Uh, no, we actually use reflective foil, and then we sprayed isonine under that. Four bedrooms. And this has actually got a radiant floor here, but it's not on. So this whole shower stall, everything in here is radiant as well. But getting to the water efficiency side, we have dual flush toilets. So they're actually using a lot less. I think our toilets are using 1.1 1 .1, uh, gallons per flush. Okay, And dual means you press one button for number one and button two for number two. But uh, there's actually no heat running in here right now except for the radiant floors. And at night when the temperature drops down, it, the house holds its temperature. Oh uh, well, they're just—they don't really have to use that. That that normally goes when you put insulated sheathing on the walls. So believe it or not, our stucco system—that's one of the best exterior wall systems to use. Yeah, totally. Up, yeah, up on the hundred floor. Yeah. What you see on the other wall? Oh no, they, they're only supposed to really be putting the lead and braces on when they use the blue. And the blue foam is actually going on the houses that are brick. But remarkably, most people are choosing the stucco finish. And it costs more. Hmm. But you can see with all the detailing inside, it's very attractive. Yeah, it's very attractive. Yeah. No, but if, if you start using our system, it's called EFIS. Okay, exterior insulated facing system. Now, yeah. is, that, is there an insulation value to that yellow board? No, but we've got outboard type 2 expanded polystyrene, which is R4 per inch. So we're getting R8 with 2 inches, and then we have the ice in the wall, so we have an R30 wall. Okay.